first of all, I'd like to say that I'm a practicing neonatologist in northeast Florida, which is one of those uh, hot states for this, this issue. Um, and so I'm on the receiving end um, of having to treat these babies and their families uh, when they come into the NICU with signs of NAF. I've worked with our State Department of Health, which has been very, very proactive in association with Pam Bondi and other people in the state government to make an impact in Florida. Um, one of the endeavors that we have um, accomplished is making NAS a reportable condition uh, slightly in a different way than Tennessee has, but in a way that we think will be useful. Um, and I've also been the lead author of the updated clinical guideline uh, on NAS uh, by the American Academy of Pediatrics, which is in the resource list. So what can I tell you about my county, Duval County, which is really the city of Jacksonville? We are certainly very much impacted by NAS. In 2012, we had the unfortunate distinction of surpassing Orange County and Tampa and Miami in terms of number of cases we had. 215 babies just in Duval County with NAS that were cared for in 2012. So that is you know, pretty huge and has certainly been a major impact here, as Scott said, in terms of uh, increasing the number of uh, days in the NICU in the census. So by way of disclosure, I don't have any conflicts of interest, financial or otherwise, germane to this presentation. I will note that our center We'll be participating in a multi-center NIH-funded study that seeks to see whether methadone or oral morphine is more effective in treating NAS, and that by itself probably tells you something about the state of the clinical art. Um, so what, um, the, what is the potential inventory of effects of antenatal exposure to opioids on a developing fetus and growing child? And this is a subject of which one could have a couple lectures, but I'll just touch on a few things briefly. First of all, there is a slight increase in certain types of congenital abnormalities, including certain types of congenital heart disease, um, hypoplastic left heart, AV canals, conotruncal defects, neural tube defects, which are things like meningeal myomacil, and also abdominal wall defects like gastroschisis, but these are increased uh, by odds ratios of anywhere from 1.8 to 2.7, and these each by themselves is very small, so one does not notice any epidemic of these problems among babies with uh, opioid exposure. There certainly is an effect of opioids on decreasing fetal growth, and there's differential effect depending upon the opioid that the mother is ex uh, exposing the fetus to. We all know that there is a profound constellation of neurobehavioral abnormalities um, that can occur at birth, which is the syndrome of uh, neonatal abstinence. Many people are interested in the long-term effects of opioids on the fetus and then into the growing child. And again, this is very complicated. The data are relatively meager and confounded by many other variables. But I think it's safe to say that there is likely a small but variable increase in things like behavioral problems as children grow up, attention deficit disorders, which present um, in the school age years and issues of memory and perception. The effects of um, fetal exposure to opioids on in intelligence quotients and executive functioning, which is a higher level cognitive functioning that uh, makes sure that people make smart decisions, um, they're really unknown. It hasn't been studied. Um, but what I can tell you is that the outlook is, is not always poor. In fact, that there are many of these babies that if they are brought up in a nurturing environment, um, turn out to be perfectly normal. So I think that's the good news there. The um, topics of interest here on prevention, I think that uh, uh, Cece and Leslie and Scott have touched on many of these issues. I'll just echo them that I do believe the education of providers and the public is really key. It is just unbelievable how ignorant people are about the effects of these drugs, even in a relatively short courses of treatment. I think providers can be educated on different classes of drugs with which to treat pain. Certainly as a medical profession, the pendulum has swung very much over the past 10, 20 years toward really meticulous attention to pain in patients and probably swung past the uh, appropriate balance point. And the public obviously is not very aware of these things either. So I think that will really be key and that's obviously when the
I think will be the biggest payoff eventually in terms of preventing opioid dependency in the general population. And that really is a huge problem. Um, I don't know if you know this, but the, the, uh, recently the number of deaths in this country due to drug overdoses, including mostly prescription drugs now, um, has exceeded the number of deaths due to motor vehicle accidents, and that's really a scary statistic. Another way for primary prevention is to concentrate on effective contraception in at-risk mothers, and many of these mothers are younger women in their late teenage and early 20s. Um, there is, I think, inconsistency among health plans as to whether or not they'll cover the most effective contraception, such as the implantable contraceptive rods, which have a 0.2% failure rate compared to 9% in practice with the routine oral contraceptive medications. So that's certainly something that can certainly prevent exposure of a baby. Um, I think the role for inpatient medically supervised maternal detoxification can be revisited. There is experience in centers that have done this, that this can be done safely. A lot of the concern by the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology has been related to data looking at um, really adverse consequences on the fetus, including death, if a mother, quote, cold turkeys, unquote, from heroin or medications, uh, other opioids. Whereas in an inpatient medically supervised detox, with the carefully selected uh, population of mothers who show the appropriate motivation and have the appropriate psychosocial profile, I think that might be something that can be looked at, at least in a research fashion. There are clearly differential effects on drugs on the likelihood, timing, and severity of the NAS, and um, I think I've got a slide coming up uh, that looks at that. So um, heroin is the illicit drug that has a very short half-life. The babies born to mothers on heroin generally, if they're going to exhibit signs, do so before 24 hours of life. The severity of signs is mild to moderate, and the likelihood of having signs is relatively low for this class of Asian. Methadone and buprenorphine have longer half-lives, so they tend to present later. Um, methadone usually presents between 24 to 48 hours of age, but may not present until three to seven days of age, depending upon metabolism. Uh, buprenorphine also is between one to three days. And the symptoms um, with methadone tend to be moderate to severe and ha occur at very high likelihood, up to 94% in some series, but not invariably. Buprenorphine tends to have m more mild to moderate uh, symptoms, and the risk of a baby having this problem is lower. And I want to present a little data um, from um, Dr. Andre Jones' study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2010, where she looked at women who were randomized to maintenance with methadone versus buprenorphine. And you can see in this graph that the length of, of infant hospital stay, the duration of their withdrawal signs and, and their treatment, and the total dose of morphine in buprenorphine was significantly less than those um, babies who had born to mothers who had been maintained on methadone. So there might be an opportunity here from a public health, public policy point of view in terms of um, uh, treating these mothers um, with the goal of minimizing the signs of NAS uh, in babies. The um, buprenorphine also causes a different type of constellation of signs, uh, whereas methadone babies tend to have a very high a uh, component of tremor, hyperactive morose, and motor signs. Babies with um, buprenorphine, exposed to buprenorphine, tend to have a higher rate of nasal stuffiness, sneezing, and loose stools. Now, the presentation of NAS, like I said, is variable. There are lots of factors that enter into that, some of which are understood, some of which are, are beginning to be elucidated. I, I mentioned the drug and the amount and the frequency. There are cofactors involved. So. I think Leslie talked about the influence of tobacco, which certainly exacerbates the signs of NAS in babies. Also, benzodiazepines, alcohol, cocaine, marijuana can also exacerbate signs, as well as stress and other comorbidities that the mother is uh, experiencing. There are certainly placental factors. There are infant factors and genetic and epigenetic factors um, that are beginning to understood. 
In terms of other pre prevention things, secondary prevention refers to the prenatal identification of at-risk infants and their monitoring. And I think that um, what we're seeing now is some areas of the country exploring with universal testing, not screening, which is a verbal sort of um, in interaction, but testing, which is a biological testing of women in labor, um, sending urine tests and so forth to look for possible opioid exposure. And so there'll be a lot coming out on that in the next couple years as to whether or not that has utility in identifying babies before they go home. Clearly, babies need to be monitored for the appropriate amount of time, and that will depend greatly upon what kind of drugs the mother was, was uh, taking. Um, if you have an accurate history um, and some maternal drug testing that will help identify that. In terms of treatment, lots of issues here. I'll just sort of touch on a few. Um, clearly, the quantification of the severity of NAS uh, is important. That is usually done by something called the Finnegan scoring tool. And this shows you all the different categories. The point here is that it's very important for the staff who is administering this tool to be well trained, to minimize any inner observer variability, and to truly make this a useful tool. Um, the um, goals of treatment have to be kept in mind, and the goals of treatment really are to minimize and not eliminate the signs of NAS. If one eliminates the signs of NAS, the baby will be so treated, the baby will be hospital for a much longer period of time. Um, it's important that we ensure normal growth patterns or the weight, rate of weight gain in these babies, help them establish normal sleep-wake cycles. We want to promote their interaction with their parents, um, caretakers, um, and so forth, and we want to avoid complications such as fever, seizures, or skin breakdown. There are a variety of non-pharmacological treatments that are effective. And I think that uh, Scott referred to some, including the dark rooms and the and the uh, volunteer. treat the families concurrently, recognizing that in most communities, these babies will go home with the family. Um, so you need to work with them to show them empathy, be non-judgmental, um, and help them with their parenting skills so that they avoid child abuse in the future. And you promote a long-term supportive environment at home, also help the family identify resources. And I think a few of the speakers talked about that. Pharmacological treatment. The goals are to allow the infant to tolerate mild signs of withdrawal. There are a number of medications that have been used to treat, and I've listed those in the slide. The practice currently in this country is the first-line treatment is usually, but not always, an opioid, mostly oral morphine, um, sometimes methadone. But there seems to be a significant and growing use of phenobarbital as a first-line treatment. The initial dose in most units is titrated to the Finnegan scores. Um, and if signs of NAS are not relieved by the maximum dose that's felt to be safe for a single drug, a second or adjunct drug is added, and typically that's phenobarbital, less commonly clonidine, and sometimes a benzodiazepine. Typically, a dose is weaned by 10 to 20 percent every one to two days, as long as the Finnegan scores are less than eight. Now, the current state of the evidence with respect to treatment, this is one of those knowledge gaps that was discussed. We do not know from the existing published data what the most effective drug class is. We suspect it's opioids. Or the most effective agent within a drug class is. Endpoints vary. Treatment failure means the baby requires a second drug for treatment. So that's important to avoid. Length of stay in the hospital is an important endpoint.
total dose of the drug is maybe a less important endpoint. But all of the studies that have been published, or most of the studies, really have methodological weaknesses that limit their utility. Important to note that protocols that use the um, Finnegan scores to initiate therapy are based on a precedent but not on evidence. So for instance, we have no reason to think that uh, starting babies when they get to a score of 8 is um, a better practice than starting babies when they get to a score of 10 or 11. We do know that having a protocol and adhering to it reduces the length of hospital stay, and there will be data coming out of the Ohio Collaborative that shows that very persuasively. Um, one clinical study looking at adjunctive treatment, this is the second drug therapy with clonidine versus phenobarbital, shows you some of the philosophical issues that uh, arise in interpreting studies. So this is a study where babies were randomized and they needed a second medication to either clonidine or morphine. Relatively few babies were studied. The primary outcome was the days of morphine therapy. And the table shows that clearly if you treated with phenobarbital as, as opposed to clonidine, you had fewer days of morphine and a lower morphine dose. However, the flip side of that is that the babies who are on clonidine had the clonidine weaned off in hospital. Babies on phenobarb could be discharged on phenobarbital, and in those cases, the home duration of treatment of phenobarbital was 3.8 months up to 8 months, and one can debate whether or not that's a good thing. And then one technical point, and I'll end with this, is um, treatment protocols, drug regimens are very important. Um, I think a lot of clinicians do not really understand necessarily the pharmacokinetics of the drugs. If one starts with an excessively high morphine dose, for instance, if you would start with, to be technical here, 0.5 milligrams per kilogram per day opposed to 0.25 milligrams per kilogram per day, you've probably committed that baby to 10 uh, unnecessary days in the hospital um, if, the, if the baby were able to tolerate being treated with the intermediate dose. And also, half-life makes a difference. So in 12 hours with a low half-life drug such as morphine, you reach a steady state concentration so the baby is you know, well treated. And if you keep dosing every three hours, the baby has a nice steady state level. If you uh, use methadone, however, this slide shows you here in the middle sort of um, seesaw bracket, um, it takes time for methadone with a longer half-life to reach an effective level, which is indicated by the blue horizontal line. Whereas if you give a loading dose and then give a maintenance dose, you're pretty much at that therapeutic level at all times. So you may be able at 12 hours in the baby who's traditionally dosed not to have sufficient relief, relief and be motivated to increase the drug dose, uh, whereas that is really the inappropriate approach in this case. Um, so those are just a few things. And um, just to sum up real quickly, because we want to leave a few minutes for questions here, you've heard a lot of information today about the many ways that NAS impacts our communities and our country. But you've also heard some unique and innovative ways that public and private sectors have come together to try to reduce you know, the number of these babies who experience these awful signs. 